could be different from Trump's administration. It will be more moderate tone, uh, more cooperation, more participation in international agreements and organizations. And we see the first signs of these potential changes with uh, Biden's administration declaring uh, a 10 day blitz of the executive orders on the certain steps which were laid by the Trump's administration, including Paris Climate Treaty, immigration policies, ban to, uh, to travel to the United States from the Muslim country. So we see this and there are also expectations related to this, but we have to realize that the reality is more complex. And a lot of energy will be wasted or an energy will be put, maybe not wasted, uh, into the internal, internal issues. First of all, the management of the biggest challenge of the last year, uh, pandemic. And this challenge will be uh, working in various areas, uh, health uh, policy, vaccination is a very big uh, logistical challenge and it's not easy we can see already in from the experience of various countries that it's it's a huge challenge and uh, not even the most e efficient not uh, even the most efficient countries are managing to do this well so that's going to be one challenge to manage pandemic uh, in as a health crisis but also as an economic crisis so that's one huge challenge. And we still um, work in the uh, situation of uncertainty. We do not know the answers. We, we do not know what's gonna happen in one month, in two months. So um, the, 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 that, is, that will require a lot of effort. Another very uh, challenging issue for the United States, uh, for the society of the uh, American people is that to overcome, uh, overcome the divisions, which uh, uh, we see now have been um, increased, partly due to the pandemic, uh, just revealing the inequalities within so the society, but also because all well, the divisions have been deepened intentionally, probably by, 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 by Trump. Uh, so uh, th this will require a lot of efforts and this is not one day job because there are a lot of discussions within society which, have, which will have to be addressed. First of all, you know, the balance between healing and accountability. And that goes not only to Trump administration but also to the whole society who is accountable to what happened. And you can say that Trump is guilty, but you know, that's a scapegoating. Many people, many uh, organizations have been participating in the process, which led to the events in Capitol. I mean, Twitter has banned the Trump's account, but why it was done now and why it was done not some years ago or why, why, why they do not ban other, you know, uh, potentially dangerous accounts and you know, some state leaders of authoritarian countries. So these discussions have to be addressed and these discussions have to take time. Another important issue, the value systems within the United States is changing and these things will have to be addressed as well because it seems that Trump is only a symbol of what American society does, do not, uh, does not want to see, the changing values private, public, certain freedoms like gun control. I, I, I assume that, you know, to have a gun, to carry a gun is very important when you live in the Wild West. And that was a very important uh, value and freedom of the American society during these days. But we live in different society today. So do we still have to put this uh, value, this right so high on the priority list? And th this is for American people to answer, but these discussions will have to happen. So a lot of efforts would be laid on, on, on those discussions. And then we've come to the international arena, which is very important for us, Lithuanians, but also Europeans and Western, Western societies. And again, we see a lot of fluctuations of the system, a lot of new trends, 
like cyber area, the like uh, competition in the astro astro area, and the, the, there is a need for new rules, new agreements, agreements that include number of countries, but not only the countries, also the businesses. How we proceed, how we live with these new realities, how we bind our behavior in order to ensure a public good, and uh, we naturally hope that United States will be participating in these uh, ne in negotiations, in these discussions, and will be setting certain tone. But uh, I think it is very important important to realize that you know you cannot sit in all chairs, and if the United States participates in these uh, discussions. There should, should be also help from the other democratic countries, um, European countries, but not only European countries, certain communities of democracies involving also New Zealand, Australia, Japan, and other countries trying to set these rules because we naturally want that the new world, the new world order would be set according to the democratic standards and not be ruled only by the authoritarian countries. So, well, now I'm ending. I know that uh, 10 minutes have passed and uh, I would say that it is very important for us to manage the expectations and to realize that we won't return to the pre-Trump United States. So if we were, want United States to be active on the international area, we have to proactively also participate in various discussions, but also other areas where we hope that United States will be participating. For instance, security. I think that you know, for us, it is a very important area. So we have to contribute more and be very vocal about our contribution and the contribution of the Europeans into this area in order to have more United States. Another important issue also to work with the society because uh, it, it, the society in the United States is changing and naturally when there are a lot of problems in, internally, there is a less will to participate in various uh, commitments internationally. And that's understandable and we have to understand this. But if we want the US to be more active internationally, we have to also give something in order uh, to show that it is in the US interest to, to commit in the international affairs. And here I stop. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you. Um, and I believe we shall proceed with uh, Dr. Miller. Go ahead. Great. Well, well, first off, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to speak here. Uh, I, I found myself agreeing with uh, much of what uh, Margarita said. So I'll try to add a, a, a couple of um, additional points and, and maybe bring out a couple of uh, areas that, that, that she didn't touch on as much. Um, you know, first off, I, I think uh, I'm in complete agreement with uh, Margarita about the primacy of domestic politics in the early stages, at least of the Biden administration. And, and for the reasons that Margarita mentioned, the, the, the fact that the pandemic is going to continue at least through the first part of this year to dominate the headlines and also dominate uh, Biden's uh, agenda at home. Uh, second, the economic impacts of the pandemic uh, remain uh, very severe and will probably persist even after uh, the virus is brought under control uh, by vaccines. So we're going to have the economic aftershocks uh, to deal with for some time. And, and these two factors combined mean that, that at least for the first year of Biden's presidency, he's going to try to focus on domestic issues. When you get into the second year of Biden's presidency, he's going to have to uh, begin thinking about the midterm uh, congressional elections that are scheduled uh, for November 2022. Uh, and because uh, campaigns in the US begin so far in advance of the election date, in reality, these midterms will begin dominating the agenda um, probably as early as the beginning of 2022. So what that means is that there's a lot of reasons, uh, both practical and political, uh, that will draw Biden into focusing on issues at home. Additionally, if you look at what Biden has promised uh, to accomplish in his 
uh, term as president, he's focused almost exclusively on domestic issues. And this isn't really that unique for American presidents. It's actually been the case that most of the uh, recent U.S. presidents have criticized their predecessor for focusing too much abroad and uh, promised to do more uh, at home instead. This was true of Trump. It was true of Obama. It was even true, uh, thinking back all the way to George W. Bush, who criticized his predecessor, Clinton, for being too focused on, uh, on foreign policy issues and not doing enough domestically. But it does seem like, given the scale of the challenges the U.S. faces at home, the divisions that Margarita mentioned, uh, and the number of items on Biden's domestic agenda, there will be a lot more focus domestically uh, than would uh, normally be the case. And if you uh, think about what Biden's promising to do, he's promised, A, a series of additional uh, actions to bring the pandemic under control, B, a very large spending program to deal with the economic aftershocks, uh, and then C, a, a broader domestic agenda focused on immigration reform, healthcare reform, um, providing more uh, child care uh, to, uh, to American families. These are issues that are, are very complicated to move through Congress. They require, uh, in many cases, at least some bipartisan agreement, and they're expensive. So all of this means that if Biden wants to accomplish these things, and it's far from clear that he'll succeed, but even if he wants to try, it's going to take uh, devoting a fair amount of his time domestically. So that's, that's the first, I think, factor to consider, is that there will be a very serious domestic focus. The second uh, key factor, which might hang over uh, Biden's presidency, and I think it's a, a question mark because it remains to be seen, uh, is, is the role of Donald Trump. Uh, Trump is, of course, uh, in many ways, a, a unique figure among American politicians. And so I don't think it's right to assume that like most presidents who lose elections, he will sort of fade out of the media limelight. He certainly wants to try to stay uh, in uh, media, try to keep uh, people's attention on him. Uh, now, it's not clear to what extent social media companies will let him and the fact that he's been uh, heavily restricted by companies like Twitter, Facebook, and Amazon Web Services means that there, it's possible to imagine a scenario in which Trump's simply not able to get people's attention because he's banned from social media. It's also plausible that Trump faces additional uh, legal pressure, not only the impeachment proceedings that are uh, underway in the Senate, but also a series of uh, legal cases that are in New York state courts, which Trump can't pardon himself uh, from and which are likely to dog him over the next couple of years. So there's also a legal aspect which might tie up Trump and prevent him from being an influential political figure. But if you presume that Trump will find a way to navigate both the social media bans that he currently faces and the legal environment after the presidency, which is far from guaranteed, but is certainly possible, uh, you can conceive of a situation where Trump launches his 2024 presidential campaign uh, at some point this year uh, and spends the next uh, three or four years attacking Biden and distracting uh, Biden from his both domestic and foreign policy agenda. And what's more important, I think, for foreign policy is that if Trump succeeds in doing that, he'll divide the Republican Party uh, as well and encourage Republicans to attack Biden uh, on all aspects of Biden's agenda, um, especially domestic policy, but also potentially foreign policy. Uh, and so this has the potential to become quite disruptive to Biden's agenda if, in fact, Trump manages to stay in the news and to remain an influential political figure. Now, again, this is far from guaranteed. It depends a lot on what Twitter does. It depends a lot on what Facebook does. It depends a lot on what Congress does with regard to the impeachment. Uh, and it depends uh, no less on what the, the, the state attorneys and state courts in New York do, which is where Trump faces uh, charges on a variety of uh, financial uh, uh, crimes. Um, but if Trump is able to manage all of these things and stay in the political limelight, uh, then it probably means that Biden's agenda becomes more difficult uh, to manage because the Republicans become more obstructionist. So those are the, the, the domestic factors that will impact the foreign policy landscape. And, and as, Margarita, as Margarita said, they're, they're very serious. Uh, it's, it's probably going to be the case that this administration, even more than most administrations, focuses on issues at home. Now, in the, the, the time that the Biden administration has to think about foreign policy, which, as I, as I mentioned, will be more limited than the average administration, I think uh, when you look at their priority list, um, what you'll find uh, is that, um, that many of the priorities will be shared with the Trump administration. Uh, and they'll have very different uh, goals about what they ought to want to accomplish with, reg with regards to these priorities, but the actual prioritization uh, will be somewhat similar. So the first priority is going to be finding a way to make foreign policy 
uh, work for the middle class and make foreign policy work uh, for uh, the Biden administration's domestic policy goals. And in a sort of strange way, this is similar to what uh, Trump had in mind, although they've got very different views of uh, how to accomplish it. Trump thought that trade was bad for average Americans and so wanted to impose tariffs and reduce trade, uh, which he thought, uh, wrongly in my view, would help them. The Biden administration has a, a different view of the remedy, but they are, are equally focused, I think, on making uh, foreign policy work for uh, the average American. And I think it's worth asking what this actually means for foreign policy. I don't think they've got a perfectly clear view of how it actually functions in practice, but it does seem like even in the foreign policy sphere, domestic political and domestic policy concerns will play a substantial role. At other foreign policy issues, the, the, the prioritization is also going to be somewhat similar to the Trump administration's. Uh, number one is going to be China, uh, which is a bipartisan uh, issue in the US. There is bipartisan concern that uh, China's power is rising and America's is declining. And there's bipartisan agreement that China is using its newfound power in ways that threaten American interests and undermine the order in the Asia Pacific and, and more in, in a more broader sense, the, the international order in ways that are detrimental to both the US uh, and its allies. And the Biden administration is going to do some things on China quite differently than the Trump administration. They won't, for example, launch a trade war against China. In fact, that's likely to be uh, partially wound down. Uh, but it will continue to confront uh, China in a variety of different international arenas. It will continue to push China on issues like human rights in Xinjiang and Hong Kong. It will continue the military buildup in East Asia designed to counter uh, China's military buildup of its own. It will continue to try to bring allies on board in a joint strategy uh, to contain China, especially focusing on allies in the Asia Pacific region like Japan, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, Australia, and to an increasing extent India, but also in Europe. Uh, and I think one of the important uh, takeaways for Europeans is that although many Europeans didn't like being called up by Mike Pompeo and told to exclude Huawei from their telecoms networks, the Biden administration might have a different tone, but the message is going to be actually, I think, rather similar, that there's going to be an expectation that uh, allies get on board uh, and treat China as, as the challenge that the US uh, sees it as. And within Europe, there's a wide variety of views as to what extent China actually represents a serious challenge. And I think this is going to be an enduring debate between the US and different European allies, which began in the Trump administration and will continue on to the Biden administration. So that's, that's foreign policy priority uh, number one in many ways. Uh, the second set of foreign po policy priorities is going to be uh, climate. Uh, the Biden administration, uh, in, in sharp contrast to the Trump administration, has uh, promised to rejoin the Paris Climate Accords and, and more than that, uh, take steps at home to fulfill the Paris climate goals. Uh, and Biden is, is going to be very keen uh, to, uh, to conclude new climate agreements with, um, with other uh, major economies to uh, try to limit uh, carbon emissions and, and, and mitigate the effects of global warming. This is going to be an area of relative agreement with uh, European, com uh, European uh, countries in contrast to the Trump administration's very different approach. When it comes to uh, policy towards Europe in general, the Biden administration thinks that uh, the Trump administration was, uh, was, um, was wrong to start so many uh, uh, conflicts with European allies. They think the Trump administration was um, wrong to treat uh, Germany in particular as a strategic rival. They think Trump was wrong to focus on the 2% spending target as, a, as the sole metric uh, for whether uh, Europe was taking defense seriously. And the Biden administration in particular is looking to uh, renew ties with Germany and France. And when the Biden team talks about Europe, uh, I, I get the sense that Germany and France are, are, are seen to be the two key players in restoring uh, ties with the European Union. And in some ways, this is very rational. Germany and France are, of course, the historic drivers of the European project, but it does have important ramifications, I think, for Central and Eastern Europe uh, when, when the administration sees Paris and Berlin as, as the two key decision makers. When it, it comes to policy towards Russia, I think we're, we're actually likely to see some uh, counterintuitive continuities with the Trump administration's approach. We're going to see one big difference, which is on rhetoric. Uh, President Trump obviously had a strange fixation with uh, Putin personally and a uh, sort of bizarre willingness to write off 
um, any uh, any negative action by the Russians is either made up or, or not detrimental to American interests. Uh, but the overall policy of the United States during his administration, uh, and this ran counter to Trump's own personal desires, was relatively similar to what the Obama administration had done. Sanctions were continued. Uh, NATO's um, forces in, in Eastern Europe were uh, reinforced. Uh, and, and generally speaking, there was no substantive improvement in U.S.-Russian relations, nor were there U.S. concessions on issues uh, like Ukraine. Uh, and, and that's going to continue to be U.S. policy, even though rhetoric from Washington will be rather different. Uh, I expect Biden to be uh, quite hawkish in terms of his rhetoric on Russia, and certainly the Russians expect something similar. And if you look at who Biden has appointed to key advisor roles in the State Department, the Defense Department, the CIA, and his National Security Council, uh, no one is, is dovish on Russia. And in fact, uh, many people are, are notably hawkish on Russia. So the rhetoric will be quite different. But in terms of actual policy, given all of the other priorities that the Biden administration has, both domestic and foreign, it's actually not obvious that there will be a big shift in overall US government policy. In other words, policy towards Russia will still be defined by the sanctions regime, which will probably stay in more or less its current format. Disagreement over Ukraine, uh, where I expect no substantive changes over the next uh, four years in either U.S. or Russian policy, uh, and a broader military standoff uh, that continues to spill over uh, both into con the conventional sphere uh, in, in the Euro-Atlantic region and also in the nuclear sphere. It's not obvious that any of these, uh, any of these core features of the U.S.-Russia relationship will change under the Biden administration. So from the perspective of, of countries in Central and Eastern Europe who are worried about Russia, in some ways, this is a very reassuring development. We're going to dispense with all of the uh, skepticism of NATO that Trump brought, but keep uh, uh, the basic uh, US policy in the region uh, largely in place. I think the one area where I see potential for tension with the Biden administration from the perspective of Central and Eastern Europe uh, is where, where it comes to right-wing populism. Uh, where the Biden administration is, is very concerned about um, uh, right-wing governments in places like Hungary and Poland. And the Biden uh, team, I think, sees Hungary and Poland uh, as, as, as evidence of the same uh, right-wing populist trend. And we can debate whether that's actually accurate to put Hungary and Poland in the same basket. I'm somewhat skeptical of uh, whether these are actually the same phenomena at play. But nevertheless, I think it is the case that within the Biden administration, uh, people do see uh, Hungary and Poland as representative of a broader trend of right-wing populist politics in Central and Eastern Europe, and as an administration that has just come to power winning an election against a right-wing populist like Trump, there is very little sympathy at all for of Hungary or Poland, and there's more generally concern uh, that politics in Central and Eastern Europe is deviating uh, from liberal democratic trends. So I see this as a potential um, point of tension between the Biden administration and the region uh, if, in fact, uh, the Biden administration comes to conclude that uh, this is an overall trend in the region uh, and is something that, uh, that the administration wants to focus on. So that's something I think worth keeping an eye on, worth following. Um, as, as both politics in the region change and as, as the U.S. Uh, re begins to focus on it under the new Biden administration. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there having laid those issues on the table, but would love to uh, dis discuss them further or any other issues that um, either you, Jurgis, or anyone in the audience has. Yep. Uh, so thank you very much to our speakers, first of all, um, for their introductory statements. And if anyone in our audience has any questions, go ahead. Just post them in the chat or use the Q and A uh, function. For the time being, uh, perhaps I'll break the ice with an initial question. Um, Chris, you wrote uh, in the Lithuanian Foreign Policy Review, and you touched upon the friction between France and Turkey. Now, of course, the U.S. might not have the solution for that. Um, it is, of course, a bilateral issue to some extent. But what could the Biden administration seek to do in regard to it? What sort of stance could it try to take? Uh, you're muted, by the way. Pardon me. The, the big question the Biden administration has to deal with when it comes uh, to Turkey is whether they think there's a chance for a reset with Erdogan. Um, there's one school of thought in the US government that says, Erdogan is a, a somewhat hopeless ally, that he's set on his path of consolidating dictatorship at home, that he's 
uh, become cl too close to Russia to break the relationship apart and that he's become too wedded to his various foreign policy conflicts with Greece, with um, with uh, with the, the rebels in Libya, with the Syrian government, with all the different uh, places that Erdogan has military forces deployed abroad uh, to be to be a constructive player in uh, in European security or or security in the Mediterranean. That's that's one school of thought. There's a second school of thought that says, well, Erdogan might be a difficult ally, but nevertheless, he's a um, a leader of a NATO member state. He's the leader of a country that. Um, has interests and capabilities that affect um, a, a whole set of um, conflicts that the U.S. has interests in as well, from the Caucasus to the Black Sea to the Middle East to the Mediterranean. And that past U.S. policy was insufficiently considerate of Turkish security interests, above all uh, with regards to arming uh, Kurdish groups in Syria, and therefore that there's hope for a a reset of relations with Turkey, not in a way that will resolve all problems between Washington and Ankara, but that will uh, manage to, to reset the relationship somewhat and, and return to a, a more functional relationship, even if a relationship that still has, has problems in it. And I think my sense thus far is that the Biden administration hasn't decided uh, which Turkey policy it it plans to implement, whether it thinks there is a real chance to, to reset the relationship and try to start it off on a on a on a on a, on a better um, uh, kind of a, a new foot on a, a better relationship, uh, and that will have a major effect on relations with NATO. It's clear that that in France the the perception is very much in uh, in the first category that that Turkey is hopeless, that it's a challenge to French security interests, uh, and that as a result uh, Macron and the the French establishment more generally have written off Turkey. From the perspective of, I think, other NATO countries, uh, it isn't always obvious that Turkey is on the wrong side and France is on the right side. In, in Libya, for example, it's France that is uh, is backing the side uh, that is is trying to topple the UN recognized government. And although I don't think anyone thinks that Libya is an easy problem to solve, uh, it doesn't seem to me that, that Turkey is obviously completely in the wrong in in, in Libya. Um, so so it does seem to me that if we if we start with the question of how will Biden uh, uh, approach Turkey, we don't know the answer to that yet. We're going to find out pretty soon. We don't know the answer to that yet. If it tries to take a, a, a policy of resetting ties with Turkey, that sets it up for tensions with France in the Mediterranean. Uh, if it tries to take a, a policy of accepting Turkey as essentially uh, an ongoing problem within NATO and, and, and betting that Turkey will remain a problem until Erdogan is gone, which isn't going to happen soon, uh, then the French will be pleased, but NATO will become uh, even harder to manage because uh, Turkey is a, a crucial player in European security and without functional uh, lines of communication open within it, I think it's hard to uh, resolve many of the challenges that we face in the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Thank you. Uh, seeing as there are currently no questions from the audience yet, I would like to encourage everyone, uh, do ask. Um, once more, a question from me in that case. Uh, this will perhaps be well, this will be to both of you, but uh, perhaps we will start with Margarita. Um, how will Biden actually fare in his relations with Europe? Uh, perhaps you could expand because, of course, we have Angela Merkel uh, stepping down from major politics, and we are unsure as to how her uh, successor will fare in that regard. So we could say that the biggest leader in Europe will be Macron, um, who is, of course, something of a Gaullist. Uh, you know, emphasizing the whole concept of European strategic autonomy, as they say. So where do you think this will go? Thank you. Thank you, Urgis. Indeed, a very good question. It's very a very interesting question because, well, one of my interests is European security and defense policy, and it's have been developing quite rapidly since 2018. And one of the reasons why it was quite successful because of Trump, because uh, European Union countries were a bit scared of uh, the consequences of Trump administration and US withdrawal, uh, scared of Trump's rhetorics vis-a-vis uh, -vis NATO, the, when he was saying NATO obsolete, scared of what might have happened to their security. And I think that France was using very smartly this card that European countries have to take care more of their own security in order 
to not to end up in the situation when the U.S. withdraws and uh, they are left with, with nothing, basing on the experience of the strategic autonomy, which comes from the history of France when they took a step to take care of their defense after the Second World War. And uh, they were investing into the strategic autonomy to be able to defend themselves on their own. And this is the same idea which is used on the European Union level. And now uh, when we are having Biden administration entering uh, the situation is changing because there is a change in tone and obviously Biden has uh, said, noted on a number of occasions that NATO is very important and the U.S. will, main, uh, will remain investing a lot in, in NATO as uh, the major alliance. So the opinion of those who have been quite skeptical vis-a-vis -vis European security and defense policies, but were so much afraid that U.S. withdraws, might change back to the very harsh skepticism uh, towards the European security and defense policy. And I can already see that, you know, it's uh, a bit stagnating and the diversion is one, once again coming back to NATO from the European security and defense policy. So that this step I, I, I see and how France will be uh, dealing with that, that's a good question because French policy towards the United States is quite interesting. It's love and hate, I would say. On one hand, there is a very clear understanding that European security, it is impossible to ensure security in Europe without the participation on the US and they understand this, they realize this, and for them it is very important that US is present militarily in terms of security in the European in, in, in European affairs. But on the other hand, uh, it comes from the old tradition of Gaulism. There is a belief that US is uh, probably in terms of value systems a bit different from the Euro Europe and Europe has to have its own path and uh, therefore European Union have, has to make decisions on various affairs, on the political affairs, on the military affairs, on economic affairs, which are independent to make independent decisions. And I think that uh, this, uh, this idea still is very um, strong in, in, in the current Fra uh, French policy. And if you listen to the uh, speeches of uh, Emmanuel Macron, so this is, uh, this uh, spirit is in there. It's about the ability of Europe to take uh, separate decisions, independent decisions on various issues without uh, the participation of the uh, United States. But I see that there is a lot of skepticism in, in, in Europe and Germany, ironically, which have been criticized a lot by Trump's administration, by not Trump's administration, but Trump is one of the biggest supporters of the United States in this, in, in this discussion, saying that no, US have to be present in many uh, discussions on a number of issues, not only on the military issues, but also uh, on the political issues, economic issues, and th there should be more US in Europe. So it, it will be interesting to see how the dynamics in uh, US, but also in Europe, uh, the change uh, of the chancellor in Germany will be impacting on these discussions. But I think that, you know, uh, at the end of the day, both sides will realize that in this very complex world, with China rising, which is uh, this rise of the rivalry between the democracies and autocracies, with so many, you know, areas that need to be discussed, uh, that need new rules, like uh, I already mentioned, the cyber area, the information area, the Astra area, all these areas will need uh, strong cooperation of democracies. 
and uh, that includes United States and Europe together, but not only these countries, but also we will need more democracies to join these discussions if we want to have, uh, you know, the world which is shaped according to the dem democratic values. Because when we see even this lessons learned from pandemia, actually this auto authoritarian Chinese method of dealing with pandemia, pandemic, in a way showed up, turned out to be quite successful for a part of the world which prefers security to the freedom to, for them, it's quite appealing because China now is in a better position than the United States in terms of how it managed this pandemic. So I, I'm a big optimist that at the end of the day, US and Europe will, ha will, will find the, the grounds for the common decisions and for the cooperation despite their philosophical distinctions. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Miller, would you have further things to add to this? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I broadly agree with what Margarita said. I think you know, two points maybe to add is one on, on the European security dimension. And I think one of the, the striking um, conclusions, at least from my perspective, is how little has actually happened despite the, the shock of, of Trump questioning NATO. Um, you know, I think one might have hypothesized, and many did at the time in 2016, that Trump questioning whether NATO was necessary and befriending, or trying at least to befriend Putin, um, might have inspired more European efforts uh, at at defense without relying on the United States. And I think the really interesting thing, actually, from an analytical perspective, is that th this didn't really happen. Uh, if you look at you know defense spending trends across Europe. Other than in a couple of countries, they're not broadly changed. Um, there's been no real effort to extend the, the French and British nuclear umbrellas, which you might expect if countries actually felt threatened. Um, so it, it, in some ways, it seems like the, the interesting thing is actually how, how little progress actually happened on the European security front. And, and I agree with Margarita that you, you get very different perspectives if you talk to people in Paris versus Berlin. Um, in, in Berlin, it really is a question of how do we make NATO work? In Paris, it's a question of how can we find other fora uh, that, that give France a, a larger voice? Um, and so long as Paris and Berlin are, are fundamentally on different pages about what, your, what European security efforts are designed to accomplish, it doesn't seem like they're going to uh, make much progress. And obviously in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the European security agenda is, is treated somewhat cautiously because of a recognition that the French see it as a way to uh, supplant NATO rather than to en enhance it. Um, but on, on, on Margaret's broader point about there being scope for uh, the US and, and Europe to work with other democracies uh, and other like-minded countries globally to set the agenda uh, and to establish a, an updated set of rules, I think there's actually a lot of scope for that. Uh, the question that I have is, is whether there's going to be focus and leadership uh, on that issue, um, certainly in the, the, di the digital sphere, uh, in terms of security arrangements in the Asia Pacific in terms of trade and economics. So there's a lot of um, places where there ought, I think, to be common ground fun found among Europe, the United States, and uh, relevant countries in, in the Asia Pacific and, and more broadly. Um, I, I hope that uh, is, in fact, where policies head over the next uh, couple of years, although I, I do see plenty of, um, uh, plenty of potential roadblocks. And I think within uh, within Europe, there are, are a variety of different views as to, to what extent China really does present a systemic challenge uh, to Europe. And, and my sense is that although the U.S. has basically decided that China is, a, is a, a, a real competitor that threatens American interests in Europe, I think there are different views as to to what extent China is a serious challenge. And that's going to um, put the U.S. and Europe in different places when it comes to answering the question of what should the new updated set of rules look like and to what extent should they consider China's interests versus actively try to exclude China. And I guess when I, I look at the German leadership election uh, from last week, um, you know, the fact that Laschet won, who is the, in many ways, the most dovish of all the candidates on China, uh, does seem to suggest that there are some en enduring gaps between where Washington is on this issue and where uh, the average European capital is. 
Thank you. Um, so we will move on. We do have questions from our audience now. Uh, as we have about 10 minutes left, uh, make the responses brief if possible. Um, this would be from Justinus Mitskus. Uh, to what extent is the US going to be the agenda setter and in which policy areas, digital world uh, trade organization reform come to mind? Uh, may the EU lead the uh, transatlantic cooperation? And whichever one of oh, yeah, you would have a response to that. Well, I, I can start and, um, and I would love to hear what Margarita thinks as well. But I think on, um, on, on standard setting, I think the challenge is actually not who's going to lead, but can the US and EU develop a coherent uh, common position? So on on WTO, I mean, my sense of the challenge at WTO is that the WTO doesn't have an effective way of restraining Chinese state subsidies, uh, and China has a veto over WTO reform effort. So I guess from my perspective, the question is really, A, is the US willing to relinquish its demand for an effective way of restraining state subsidies? B, is China going to allow an effective um, state subsidy constraint mechanism or C is nothing going to happen. And I guess it seems like the most likely answer is, is C and no matter what the EU proposes, it's not obvious that that that, um, that question gets resolved because even if the EU says it also wants, as the EU has said, it wants an effective state subsidy mechanism, it's not clear that China is going to offer concessions on that issue given that state control is at the center of, of how the Chinese Communist Party uh, controls the economy. Um, on digital issues, I think, uh, again, the question is not who's going to lead, but is there a common agenda? Um, for example, on digital tax, there are substantial disputes between um, the US and Europe on uh, the role of uh, social media companies and what types of regulation there ought to be. There are substantial disputes on uh, privacy legislation. It's possible the US will move a bit more towards a GDPR standard, um, but far from guaranteed. And I think just in general, the the US is more or less a fair on digital issues than uh, the European uh, mainstream is. Um, so these are issues that it's not obvious that there's actually agreement, even when leaders in both sides say they'd like to agree. Uh, when you read their statements more closely, they're, they're often saying they wish either the Europeans or Americans would come over to their position. Uh, so as much as I would like a, a common digital agenda, I think the places where we haven't seen one yet are places where there's not agreement. And so it's not obvious that there will um, that, that, that there will be more agreement now that, that Biden is in power. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in this sphere, but I, I think it's easy, to, easy to, to listen to Biden's promise to work with Europe and easy to listen to the European leaders' promises to work with Biden. But when you actually dig a, le a level deeper, it's not so clear uh, that there is agreement on what exactly they mean when they talk about working together. So, Margarita, would you have any comments? Basically, I very much uh, subscribe to Chris' um, belief that it's not about the, you know, which areas uh, and is there potential for leadership, but first of all, there should be agreement on the common agenda on, in, in a number of areas, because we have seen a lot of divisions uh, during past uh, years, and sometimes those divisions were not very you know, substantial, but more rhetorical, but still there should be more discussions to find those important aspects that uh, have to be changed or worked on. And I think that, you know, the changing uh, society, the changing uh, international and internal politics will push the leaders of all the countries anyways to sit down and find these agreements because the other day i was listening for a conversation on cnn regarding you know this twitter blocking facebook blocking and the freedom of expression of individual and there was a eu internal market commissioner commenting on these issues on cnn and I was hearing this discussion, which was rather new to the uh, American discussions about, you know, the limitations of the business giants, technological giants, that, you know, public issues sometimes might be above the 
uh, private uh, private issues that you know private uh, freedoms ha have to be limited uh, for the public interest and that that was very interesting to listen to this discussion because i think that there are things what the us has to learn from the european union in order to go forward to uh, in, in these discussions and there are things where the European Union has to learn from the United States. For example, the uh, um, this, uh, um, initiative on safe network, which comes from the United States Trump administration, also is, is a very important in terms of the preventing authoritarian countries to set the rules for the cyber uh, area. So I think that at some point there is uh, no uh, need for more conversations. And I think that, you know, reality would be pushing both sides to have those conversations and some areas will be, uh, uh, will, will require more leadership from the European Union and some areas would be led more by the United States. One area to be mentioned where I can see some potential a lot of potential is the uh, change of economies in terms of ensuring uh, uh, climate change, uh, uh, fighting uh, with the climate change. And I, I can hear the, the you know, discourse on both sides of the Atlantic about the pandemic giving a unprecedented opportunity to change the economies, to make them greener, more sustain, sustainable and also to change the consumer's choices. So I think that this will be the area in the coming years where there will be agreement on both sides. And I think that US leadership also is more than welcome in this area together with the European Union. Thank you. And my colleague pointed out, I was mistaken since we started five minutes later. So we still have about 10 minutes now. Um, next question is from uh, Vikintas Pugachauskas. Um, let's see, as you have alluded to, uh, I believe this was uh, submitted after uh, Dr. Shishelgita spoke, so that would probably be regarding your statement. As you have alluded to, many Europeans believe Trump was not an aberration, but rather a symptom um, of the changed America. Uh, could you expand on the ways the Europeans might be hedging their bets against uh, Cotton, Haley, Pompeo, Pence, Carlson, jun uh, Jr., one of their administrations in four years' time? And could there be something that the Biden administration could do to allay those concerns apart from trying to generally deal with the malaise in society? So perhaps we'll start with Mar Margarita in this case. I thought that Chris is more a uh, proper person to answer about nitty gritty of the American societies, but I can start uh, rather superficially, but then Chris might deepen uh, what I will say. Uh, the problem uh, we see uh, with, with how we see the United States is we see uh, United States as an international player, but United States is a state with a lot of internal issues and with a society who makes decisions on who is elected and who takes the decisions on the international politics. So by extensions, if we have certain expectations towards the US participation in the foreign affairs, it is the society which decides what kind of participation is or should be. And the point is that the, the society is changing in the US. And on one hand, there are a lot of challenges within society, which is definitely a priority for the society, but also this sort of a attitude vis-a-vis -vis international politics, politics of foreign affairs is changing in the society. In the years of the Cold War, I think that, you know, big part of the society of the middle class they were interested on what's happening in the world and that they were fighting the war against the soviet union now the international politics is more complicated 
And when we say that, you know, US have to stand behind us in our fight with Russia, it's not natural now. And we have to also uh, sort of bring up the issues which are appealing for the society, which is electing the politicians. And those issues, there are a number of issues. First of all, I already mentioned climate change is the issue which is appealing to a part of the society. Of course, there is a division in the society. We have to take care also uh, uh, into account these issues. Uh, democracy, equality, all sorts of things that we can work together with the United States and also will to show the society that these issues also are important on the international uh, arena, but also doing uh, some homework ourselves. And uh, I think that the um, Vikintas was also relating this to, you know, the uh, uh, support for democracies. Uh, so this is also very important that we should be showing our support for democracy in our states, but also outside our states. Democracy is a very important value and we should not support the double standards. We have to talk, we be, have to be vocal about democracies because what happened uh, uh, with the election of Trump, uh, countries which are affiliated with the United States, either the members of the same alliance or have very good uh, uh, foreign policy relations, they tend to mimic her United States behavior. And uh, this uh, 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 sort of not very democratic behavior, it was uh, spillovering in many countries, in, in particular in Central and Eastern European countries, the countries for whom United States is sort of an idol. And we had a very interesting discussion with Estonian colleague who was saying that, you know, if not Trump, maybe we wouldn't have had ECRE in the government because it was not normal. We would have been ashamed to have something uh, like that in our government. So I think that if it's a double way uh, game. So on one hand, we are trying to mimic what's happening there, but also the United States. Uh, if we are setting certain standards of normal and we are abiding those standards, there is also a signal for United States. So I am not an expert on the internal policy of the United States. So I want to give the further floor to Chris. Yes, uh, and well, Chris will have to be running, so this will be our final answer then. Okay, I'll 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 be uh, trying to be efficient. I mean, I think on the the question of um, what uh, what domestic political steps would be necessary to uh, to sideline Trump and to uh, address the concerns of of his supporters, I mean, I don't know that I've got a. Um, a, a particularly confident answer to that. And I think this is going to be the big question of American politics over the next couple of years. So uh, in some ways, I guess I'll, I'll try to uh, I'll avoid that question simply because I think it's too soon to tell and we're going to see the Biden administration and other Republican leaders trying to answer it on their own in the next couple of years. But I think what we can say with a bit more confidence is uh, the question of, of will and should European leaders hedge in case of a, a post-Trump um, Republican leadership, someone like Cotton, Nikki Haley, Mike Pompeo, and and here I think it's it's worth considering what that would mean for Europe. Anyone except for for one of Trump's children, who I think are are, are harder to assess what they would believe in. But if it, if you were to imagine a president, Tom Cotton, or a Nikki Haley, or a Mike Pompeo, a lot of what Trump did in terms of questioning NATO or befriending Russia, those are things that would not happen at all under a Cotton administration or a, a Pence administration. So in some ways, for uh, frontline countries in Central and Eastern Europe that are especially worried about Russia, it's not obvious that a cotton administration would be all that problematic for them. I think the issues would rather be on, um, on, on the issues that are mainstream Republican party politics. Um, climate would be, again, an issue of controversy, potentially controversy over trade. Um, but these aren't, these aren't Trump issues, these are Republican issues. Um, and so this would be a sort of a return to the Republican mainstream if you were to have Cotton or Haley or, or even Pompeo. So, so that's actually a, a, a vision of a Republican Party without Trump. Um, if, if you were to get Trump again in four years or one of his children, that would provide a lot more uncertainty, I think, as to how the U.S. would, 
uh, and engage in Europe. And so it's much harder to predict um, what the results would be. But if you're a European leader thinking about hedging, I think the ramifications of a, a Tom Cotton presidency are, are really quite different than the ramifications of, of what the Trump presidency brought or, or a, a new Trump or Trump Jr. Uh, presidency uh, could potentially bring in the future. Thank you. Um, and since this is basically a one word uh, answer, any predictions to what country or region the uh, president of the United States might visit first? Oh, I don't know. I, I think Europe is a is a safe bet, but it's it's far from certain. Okay, Margarita. I'm subscribing to what Chris said. I'm sorry, I don't have crystal ball. <laughs> it's difficult to say now. Very well. Well, in that case, uh, we have run through our time. Thank you very much for both of our panelists. It was very enlightening, very interesting. And uh, tomorrow begins a very new, interesting, curious four years. So let's hope it gets better after them. <laughs> Thank you very much to all of our participants. Once Thank again. you. Thank you.